Well, welcome everyone to the Spoken Gospel Podcast. Thank you so much for joining us. We are continuing our journey through the book of Romans. Uh, Last week, we kind of did all the introduction. We looked at the situation, the context, who is Paul, what was going on in the church in Rome, what was going on in Rome itself. And we looked at the table of contents that opens up the first chapter of Romans, as well as Paul's thesis statement. And today, we're going to start tracing Paul's argument through the whole book of Romans and hearing the yeah, gospel. That's right. Which I'm very excited about. So, uh, how would you recap what we talked about last time, especially when it comes to like what's going on in Rome and the gospel that they need to hear? Yeah, the beginning of the argument before yes. the first proofs of it. Like the yeah, thesis yeah, yeah, yeah. Well, what's I think the thesis statement? What Paul said is that he, the gospel is the power of God for salvation. So, in the death and resurrection of Jesus and his ascension to his throne as the cosmic Lord of the universe. He, his salvation over the powers of empire, of sin, and death have been fully and finally demonstrated. Mm. And we can have access to that victory over the powers of sin, death, and empire by faith. Mm. Um, By by faith. By only faith. By nothing else but faith. And so the first thing that Paul is going to prove in his argument is that both non-Jewish people and Jewish people are ruled by the power of sin, Hmm. that they are under the domain of sin and death and need a salvation from it, a rescue from it by God's saving power. And so that's Hmm. the first thing he does. Okay. And so, and also as a matter of just trying to get our minds back in the story here, um, why is the gospel of a cosmic king Mm -hmm. who can bring a rescue from earthly powers, sin and death, why is that the gospel that Paul is emphasizing mm. to a Jew Gentile contentious church in Rome? Yes. I mean, I think very contextually, you could say that you have a Roman emperor who has artificially separated Jew and Gentile and pushed them back together as a matter of imperial policy. Yeah. And he's saying, hey, there is a bigger and ta- bigger and badder power, namely Jesus, who is uniting us, not dividing us. Mm. And the cultural forces and even the, and some of the ethnic battle lines that you've drawn for yourself are not determinative. What's most determinative is our inclusion in the family of God and the salvation that he's accomplished through Jesus Christ. That's good. Yeah. So yeah. he's like wants to level the playing field in a sense okay. um, and said, hey, we are not primarily defined by our ethnic categories or our imperial occup our status as imperial occupants yeah but under the reign of jesus christ that's really helpful okay and so you said that the first kind of groundwork that he has to lay out here was what what's his first argument that we're going to talk about we're all under the power of sin and death that we're all under the power of sin and death and that we need to be rescued by god's saving power from okay it. <laughs> and the reason he's doing that to prove this point mm-hmm. is to make them feel I guess, like how bad things are before he talks, before we hear about how good the king is. Like you, you need say, to know how oppressed you are before you can know how free you are. Or why is he starting here? You could probably say it that way. <laughs> like, Let it, me uh, help uh, you here uh, though, David. <laughs> this is um, like one valid way to do but he, it. <laughs> but I think he's also just, I mean, people have said Paul's offering us a systematic theology mm. or he's giving us like his entire theology. Like, you know, like this systemic, portrait of how people are saved before God, sure. including his family. I think maybe a, a better way to say it is that like he wants to explain from the very beginning um, why we ne- all need Jesus. Mm. <laughs> and it's not maybe not so much about making us feel worse in order to feel better, but say, but reminding us all where we have come from and where what Jesus has done for us. Oh, okay. Is it, is it that, um, in order for the Jews and Gentiles to, uh, both come under King Jesus united, Mm -hmm. they need to understand they're both on the same footing. Yeah. They they both started at the same place, which was destitute, sinful, under death and in need. That's right. And it's like, you guys can argue about who was first and who has the revelation and who's more moral and whose city this is. But Can the, we just say you're all under sin and death, and yeah. we all start on square one together? Right. That's exactly right. We, yeah, that's that's well, good. Somebody might have the law, somebody might not, but that's irrelevant mm. because we were all dead, yeah. s- 
trapped by our sinful desires under the power of sin and needed to be rescued. It's a it's a it's a Christian theological way of the like the common phrase we get today, which is like, hey, we're all human. Yeah, that's right. We're all human. We can start there. Mm -hmm. It's a good starting point, mm -hmm. and it levels the playing field. That's we're right. all human. Yeah, that's good. Okay, so that's where he's starting. That's where he's starting. We're all human, and it sucks. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Is that what? Yeah. That's yeah. right over yeah, 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 yeah. <laughs> so he begins by talking about um, how God's wrath or his justice against human evil has been poured out on the unrighteousness, the, the immorality of Gentile culture. And that's the first thing he's going to do. He's going to attack and level the Gentile culture and said, hey, the Gentile culture is ruled by sin and death. Mm. And so what he's going to, his argument is, is fairly simple. He says, God created the world with a particular wisdom and design in mind. And that design and wisdom is clearly evident to people who are paying attention. That the world is a created place, that the world has a particular order to it, and the way that life works is fairly evident. However, on the whole, Gentile culture has refused to believe that there is one creator God yeah. that has designed his world in a particular way that is meant to be obeyed, and instead started worshiping things within the world. They worship beasts and cows and creeping, mm -hmm. crawling things. They worship the sun. They worship anything. Caesar. Caesar. <laughs> Other than the true creator of the universe, yep. the true creator and designer of the universe. Hmm. It's like, this is the way Gentile religion generally works. Okay. Okay. Is there, is there an example you can give of like, here's how God reveals himself and his wisdom in the world uh, is like, it makes sense. You should live this way because it's evident in how God made the world. But then look at Gentile culture. They're not doing it. I mean, the way Paul says it is in verse 20. Okay. Uh, for his invisible attributes, namely his eternal power and divine nature, have been clearly perceived ever since the creation of the world in the things that have been made. So they, meaning the Gentile world, are without excuse. Because even though they knew God, they did not honor him as God or give thanks to him, but became futile in their they're thinking is that answering your question like that's the way that paul is stating the problem it's like they yeah, are it's just, it's refusing just all, to honor yeah it's just kind of all abstract mm -hmm. it's like what do we mean here that like the life cycle of grass teaches us something about how god operates and we're like no that i don't want to do that i want to go worship a cow instead like okay those aren't yeah, talking yeah, yeah. to each other for me okay paul is going to do this for us okay in probably a way that makes a lot of us uncomfortable oh great uh, can't uh, wait can't wait so let's th think about the Genesis story. Okay. Like God creates a world full of generative life. Everything uh -huh. bears fruit after its own kind. Yeah. Right? He, he creates seed bearing plants and their seeds create the same kind of plants and yes. their seeds create the same kind of plants. And propagation that, of life. Propagation of life. And the one command Adam and Eve are given is to like be fruitful and multiply. Make babies. The design of the world is one of fruitfulness and yes. abundance. Yep. And there seems to be Paul saying that that intention and design for fruitfulness and abundance is hamstrung by um, Gentile religions and Gentile culture. He says that begins with choosing to honor created things over the life-giving thing, things that have an end on the earth rather than the thing that is above oh, all things. Okay, so there what you're saying is look at the world. Can't you tell it's a created place? Mm-hmm. But you're not looking for to, like a creator to worship. Yeah, you're worshiping what was created. That's right. And so the world should have told you that there's something outside of creation because right. it's so beautiful, it's so complex, and something that gives life outside of creation. Because he says here, you exchange the glory of the immortal God mm. for images resembling mortal man. Ah, uh, obviously there's a life giver with perpetual life outside of this system, but you're just worshiping everything that dies. That's right. What are you doing? That's Don't right. you know there's something better? And so, okay. what, so what Paul says is that what God has done to the Gentile world, the non-Jewish world, when they have made this decision, is he gives them over to their the delusion of worshiping death. I see. If, and like, if, if, that's, you, if that's how you want to live, I'm going to let you live that way. If you want to pursue and worship things that die and things that do not bring life, I will let you do so mm -hmm. until your own destruction. It's going, yeah, you're going to worship death and you're going to become, become like death. That's right. You're going to die. And so what Paul is saying is that the Gentile world is ruled by a culture of death 
under the power of sin. I God see. has confirmed yep. that sinful direction of rejecting God mm-hmm. and made it so that inevitably the Gentile world will tend towards destruction and death because they worship things that don't bring life. Uh-huh. They worship things that die. God made a self-propagating, seed-bearing, life-creating world, mm-hmm. and the Gentile world has pursued death-bringing, <laughs> mortal-ending, That's right. non-life things. That's right. And therefore, it will inevitably end because it's not propagating itself. That's right. Okay, I think I follow that. Yeah, and so this is why Paul, and this is where it gets uncomfortable for us, um, this is why Paul ends this conversation by talking about male and female homosexuality. Because hmm. he uses them as these paradigmatic examples of a denial of the creator, of the life-giving creator. And the reason he, he does that is because they are relationships that essentially deify the creation, deifying something that dies, but also it's a relationship that is, that is unable to give life. It's like no matter oh, what. Bi- biological. Biolo- biological. Yeah, yeah, There's yeah. no biological way for that relationship to bring and reflect the life-giving designs of the creator. Hmm. And so that's why he uses it as an example of, of the like ultimate death that Gentile culture will produce. Okay, so yes, I think I understand what's happening here. God has revealed himself in how he made the world. It's a life-giving world, but we've chosen, uh, or I guess we, the Gentile world there, has chosen um, things that produce death, and they are deifying created things uh, to their own destruction. Right, and okay. God confirms that. He's, he's like, he hands them over to it. And so there's this real active sense that God has like put a limiter on the top of them. They cannot go backwards anymore. Mm. And I would say that that's the power of sin. Like sin prevents them from accessing the life-giving God anymore and only produces increasing death over time mm. until their own destruction. So this handing over will, by God, is the power of sin. He hands the Gentile cultures over to the power of sin until their own death. Yeah, and I guess that's a hard logic to argue with because like, hey, look at your entire life. Mm-hmm. Does anything you do help you escape death itself? And yeah. Like, well, no, I guess not. And I think even more viscerally, doesn't our culture seem to celebrate things that bring about death mm. over, like, over time? Like, like I think that's kind of clear from a lot of things in our world. Right. So his argument is, isn't it clear that the Gentile world is under the power of sin and death and that there's no escape from mm-hmm. it? That's the argument all yep. the way to the end of chapter one. That makes sense. And so the Jews in the audience then are thinking like, yeah. Go get him, Paul. Go get him, Paul. You got it. We have the, we've got, we've got the law. We know how to live. All, all of our ways of being are completely in line with how God made the world. That Looks is an like, accurate representation of the immorality of Gentile that's culture. That's right. It's like, I've been saying this to everybody right. in my right. synagogue. <laughs> yes. <laughs> all the Jews. I've been telling all the Gentiles they need to get their act straight. And so does Paul turn the knife on the Jews? He does turn the knife on the Jews. And he ba- and he condemns them through chapter uh, two. Essentially, um, one, it's like, hey, you pass judgment on these immoral Gentiles, right? But you're guilty of the same exact sins that the Gentile world is. And then he goes on and gives um, just example after example about how Jewish people in general have abandon God's commands and do the same immoral things. Mm. He's, he's basically his first charge is hypocrisy. He's like, hey, yeah, you condemn them, but aren't Jewish people just as guilty of the immorality they see in the Greek and pago uh, Greek world? Yeah. And he's like, and then everyone has to say, yeah, yeah, I guess, I guess we do. It's like, yeah, we I do these right. other good identity marker things, but I guess we also do the bad things that we judge them for. Right. Being a hypocrite's fun. Yeah. So Paul basically calls them hypocrites, but then he actually says that Jewish people actually might be more culpable before God. Hmm. And he says like, hey, the Gentile world did not have a written revealed code about how they should behave among one another or in relationship to God. You did. God wrote wrote down for you a whole bunch of laws Hmm. about how to relate to him, how to relate to one another, how to relate to your governments. So the Gentiles had creation to look at. Don't, don't seeds, don't, don't like, don't plants that grow bear seeds after its own kind. That should kind of show you something about how to live your life 
in accordance with the biological way God made the world. Yes. And they had to infer those things through general revelation of nature. But the Jews have written down laws that tell you exactly what God wants. That's right. So you guys had it a little more clear and you still broke the law. Yeah, you're more you're more culpable before God. And his point here is like you're not exempt from any of the morality of the Gentile world. You might actually be more culpable. Mm. And I think there's probably a sense that Jewish people believed that like by the fact of having a law just made them a little bit better than the rest of the world, mm. right? Like, mm -hmm. hey, we have God's revealed will. Yep. We have, God has communicated to us, not the non-Jews of the world. And so there could be a temptation in that moment to say like, hey, we don't keep it perfectly, but at least we have the law. That's right. Not to push buttons unnecessarily here. Yes. But it is an interesting mm -hmm. um, allegory is I think we can do the same thing as Westerners uh, with democracy or something. Okay. Yeah. And we look at at lawless lands you know yes. that are ruled by dictatorship or bribery or whatever and like oh man it's just so messy over there and everything's just controlled through bribes and mm -hmm. pride and mm -hmm. uh, it's like we have the power of the people and we have a democracy but then you look behind the curtain and it's like everyone's being paid off everyone's being bribed we just call them lobbyists right? yeah exactly yeah. <laughs> and it's like it's the same thing yeah. yeah but we have the law we have right. a good law system yes and it's like yeah but you're guilty of all the same stuff that's and right actually you've you've identified the fact that you know better and you've put checks and balances to guard against these things and yet you still do them right so aren't you more culpable yes than those who are just like don't have the law system so yeah. it's, it's it's an interesting allegory that's right and so and then paul will say and it's like, so you might take pride in the fact that you have this superior law, right. but that means nothing if you break any of it. So he says this in verse 25. Mm -hmm. So the, the, like the most characteristic command of the Old Testament is circumcision, right? Yeah. So he says this, for circumcision indeed is a value. That's a good law. Mm. If you obey the law, but if you break the law, your circumcision becomes uncircumcision. He's like, hey, like that is a good thing, right? Right. But if you break the law, you're that doesn't mean anything anymore. Yeah, it it's invalidates. A, it's, a, it. it's a good thing to uh, pay your income tax. That will keep you out of prison. Mm -hmm. But if you murder someone, your it doesn't matter that you paid your income tax. You're still going to prison. Yes, that's right. <laughs> that's right. So but I paid my income tax. It, it's like it is a fine, whatever. Yeah, it's not. You still gonna, broke the law. You still broke the law, and your law, the law in that moment, your special status as the recipients of God's commands, doesn't save you or excuse you from your culpability under God's that's right. justice. But I'm a tax paying you at a citizen. Who cares if I murdered someone? That's doesn't right. Doesn't that mean I get out of jail free? Yes. No, you're a lawbreaker. Yes. And you're. Uh, citizenship standing and past deeds do not invalidate your law breaking. That's right. Okay. And then he goes on to say in this moment too, he's like, in fact, I think most Jews would agree that like if somebody was uncircumcised but ended up keeping all of God's laws, you would actually consider them a true Jew, right? Yeah. A true member of God's covenant family, even if they hadn't done that one thing yet. And they would be like, yeah, probably. Like They still need to do that, but yeah. they are acting as if they are in line with God's um, will and designs, mm -hmm. even though they don't have the physical marker that would indicate that they are such. Mm -hmm. So what he's doing in this moment is like he's just relativizing the importance of the law or of those identity markers, of those identity markers in how um, your culpability before God is increased or decreased. Yeah. The fact that you are a member of the community that received the law does nothing to in increase or decrease your culpability before a just God. Like what increases or decreases your culpability before a just God is whether or not you obey his designs. Yeah. Right? Whether right. you're circumcised or not, whether you're a part of that covenant community or not. Yeah. What matters according uh, in front of a just, holy, pure God is whether you're just, pure, and holy. Okay. So I'm listening to this in this uh, Roman church. I'm yeah. hearing this letter and I'm a pretty good guy. Mm -hmm. And I, it doesn't matter if I'm Jew or, or Gentile. I don't even think that way. It's like, oh man, he nailed. He nailed. I don't. I don't. I don't. I don't, I don't side. I, I don't just see Jewish. I'm, I'm. I'm. I'm Jewish blind. I don't. I don't do that. And so it's like we. Uh, he's like, okay, yep. I don't do any of that stuff that the Gentiles got called out for doing. Um. Uh. I don't do any of the things the Jews got called out for doing. I think I'm actually what you just said. Like, 
my culpability to law breaking is based on my moral standing. And like, mm-hmm. if I do what God says to do, I actually think I did a pretty good job. Yeah. Where, is he going to come after me too? He d- he doesn't <laughs> assume anyone's as prideful as you are. Oh, good. That's good. <laughs> he, uh, he will, uh, he, I think Paul, by this point of the argument, thinks he's got everybody under his gun. Like everybody should be, feel like they are sinful before a holy God. However, he does go on in chapter three to summarize this argument. And he says this, no one is righteous. Oh, man. No one, no, no one, not one. No one understand. No one seeks God. What about me though? No one. All have turned aside. Oh, okay. Together they have become worthless. No one does good, not even one. So I guess he does address you. This, I was baiting that the, question. The, the proud one. <laughs> Um, but I think this functions as a summary, a not summary. as a, an extra poke okay, as okay, a, at the that's extremely helpful. proud. That's but, true. He's uh, like, I've talked about all people now because I talked about Jews and Gentiles. Yes. So now I can say as a summary, no one is righteous. That's right. We're all underneath the power of sin and death and need a, sa- a savior. Yes. Okay. And during this point of the conversation, Paul kind of interrupts the flow of the conversation about universal human culpability before mm. a just God by speaking to the jew his jewish brothers and sisters in the audience okay he he's like so so he's imagining like okay if the law doesn't do anything to increase or decrease our culpability before god yeah um what good is it being jewish at all then right if that was supposed to mark if being jewish being circumcised receiving the law was supposed to mark a special relationship with god and it didn't do if all that really mattered was obedience what good is it being Jewish? What good is it is receiving being a part of the community that received the law? Like totally. What, what good is that? And what good is obeying if I can't obey perfectly enough to? Uh, no one's righteous. Yes. What's the point in obedience? Yes. So you have the two big questions. Yeah. And so to the to the question that I posed, so the the tangent that he do, goes mm-hmm. on from three chapter one through eight, he's going to start a conversation he's not going to finish until later. But basically, what he says, like no Jew. Being part of the Jewish community is a great thing, uh, actually. There's many benefits to being Jewish. And he basically lists the fact that the good news of God's blessing to the world came to the Jew first. Right. It's you got the prophets. You got the prophet promises of the Messiah. You got the Holy Scriptures. You had God's divine revelation. You are the people that God saved from Egypt. And he's like, hey, God's saving actions have been concentrated at first among the Jewish people. There is great benefit to being a part of the Jewish community. Mm -hmm. However, that doesn't invalidate my point that I said about Jewish culpability before the law. So does does that make sense? Yeah. Yeah. He's like fencing. It's like, hey guys, it's still good to be Jewish. It's not ultimate to be Jewish, but it's good to be Jewish. Right, yes. That makes Uh, sense. Okay. Yep. So he's like, okay, it's good to be Jewish. Yep. And not ultimate. But what do we do with our humanity's total inability? Right. To obey the law. It's like, okay, I apparently I knew what I should have done and I didn't do it. And I guess even if I knew it and I had it revealed to me, I still wouldn't do it. So, and no one's righteous. Yeah. So how do I escape this sin and death thing? Yeah. I'm, uh, am I just hopeless? So Paul says it this way in verse 20 of chapter three, for by works of the law, no human being will be justified in his sight since through the law comes the knowledge of sin. Like he's, he, yep. a, anyway. The point is, like, hey, no one's going to get it right. Yep. Verse 21. But now, the righteousness of God has been manifested apart from the law, although the law and the prophets bear witness to it. The righteousness of God through faith in Jesus Christ for all who believe. There is no distinction. For all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God, and all are justified by his grace as a gift through the redemption that is in Jesus Christ. Okay. So, yep. So, th- so there's two leveled playing fields he's doing with these mm-hmm, words. All. Mm-hmm. All. Uh, there is no distinction. Like we've been, you guys are obsessed with distinctions. Mm-hmm. Jew, Gentile, Roman, Jewish. Like yes. There's no distinction. All have sinned and fallen short. I've proven it to you through the general revelation of nature and the specific revelation of the Torah. Yes. All have sinned and fallen short of the glory of God. But now also all. Mm-hmm. And we get introduced to this new idea, or not new idea, he set it up in the thesis, mm-hmm. but all are justified freely by Jesus. That's right. So talk about that. Yeah. So he says, for now the righteousness of God 
has been manifested apart from the law. So what is he, what is he talking about here? So we talked about the righteousness of God in the first episode. Mm-hmm. We talked about three ways that you can understand the righteousness of God. Right. The righteousness of God can be God's saving power to rescue somebody from, a, from the power of death. It could also mean like the gift of being considered righteous. Like you are now a member of God's family despite what you deserve. Mm-hmm. It could also mean like a moral righteousness, right. like the moral righteousness of God. So what I think he's talking about here is, okay, we've established that there is no right standing before God based on your perception of the natural order or your comparative standing up to the law, mm-hmm. to the, the Hebrew law, because everyone's broken both both of them, right? Right. You misunderstood and worshiped created things, or you took, you did one thing like circumcision, but didn't do the thing about adultery. And like the law has not done nothing for you, mm. right? Both are equally culpable. However, the righteousness of God, being in right standing with God, mm. being given and granted access to God himself has been manifested apart from any of our obedience by Jesus Christ. Mm-hmm. Am, am I making yeah, sense? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Am I making, making sense, sense here? Yeah. Like there's like so much like assumptions that Paul is making. So I wanted yep. to make sure that we're communicating here. The righteousness of God through faith in Jesus Christ for all who believe. So how do we, you asked the question, what good is it to continue trying? That's right. If I, I, I can't, um, yep do any of the things the law commands. Yeah, I can't be made right with God. I can't achieve moral righteousness. And I can't bring the justice of God to bear on my world. I can't do any three of the definitions of righteousness by obeying out of my own ability. And Paul says, like, hey, you're asking the wrong question. Mm -hmm. It's not about what you can do according to any of the standards Mm -hmm. that we know about. It's about what Jesus Christ has done and whether or not we have faith in him. Mm. Does that... I get what you're saying, I think we need to unpack that. Yes. Like how does, what, what did Jesus do Mm -hmm. that accomplished the righteousness of God is the first question. Yes. And then how does our faith in that bring about an effect? So for all of sin and false for the glory of God, we got that under, we got that one. Here's what Jesus did and are justified by his grace as a gift through the redemption that is in Christ Jesus. That's the phrase that we're talking about now. Like how did he do it? Yep. He did it by, justifying us by his grace as a gift. Mm. So the word justification is like a, like a, is a really important theological concept, but it means to be declared innocent in God's divine courtroom. Mm-hmm. We've been talking about moral culpability before God. What's happening in this moment is through Jesus' death and resurrection, God looks at us and he once said, hey, guilty. Mm-hmm. You are guilty of a culture of death. You are guilty of hypocrisy. You are guilty of abandoning the law. You're more morally culpable than everybody else because of X, Y, and Z reason. But because of what Jesus did in his death and resurrection, you are now no longer held liable for the culpability of your past. Right? No longer held liable. You are no longer considered guilty. You have been declared righteous. I think we haven't quite talked about maybe the wages of sin is death part enough to make that culpability, the liability make sense. Oh yeah. 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 Because we, the the only way we've talked about death so far is as a natural outworking of sin in the Gentiles where it's like they, Mm -hmm. they don't do life giving things. So they end up dying. Yes. What, what are these wages of sin? Yeah. yeah, yeah, That is death thing. Where is that coming from? So we talked about how, like when God hands the Gentile world over Mm -hmm. to their, desires for death they are eventually killed that's right sin leads to death and that same thing is true in the 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 hebrew story too they were given a law but sin took over and they disobeyed that law and just like the gentile world jews have died under the power of sin and even in the law it told them that was going to happen was going to be what happened if you break this you're going to die and what the way that death looked really historically was their exile to Mm -hmm. babylon and to assyria and they're conquering by foreign powers. Yeah, like right. because their special relationship with God centered around a nation, their death was national in a lot of ways. It was individual as well, but yep. like there was, was separation this... from their life giving God. That's right. Yeah. Through through exile. So both the Jewish story and the Gentile story ends in death. And okay. so we need a solution that makes us no no longer morally culpable of the consequence death. Right, mm-hmm. making us to where we don't 
just breed death with the way we live, mm -hmm. bringing about the natural consequences of death, yes. but also not breaking the design and commands of God, yes. which he has said in his law, demand death yes. from a, a justice standpoint. From a just, yes, that's okay, right. Okay, I think I'm understanding that. And so yep. what Jesus did was he died. Even though he was, I mean, there's a lot of he's assuming here, but mm -hmm. we can talk about like the legal aspects to how this works. But Paul's assuming all this. He's saying that when that moment when Jesus died and as a representative for all people, and mm -hmm. he'll talk about this in the coming chapters, and then rose from the dead, he was proving that he has power over death, which is the consequence of sin. Mm -hmm. So if in Jesus, in his resurrection, can defeat the weapon of sin, which right. is death, that means there's a way out of the power of sin and death. Yes, and the only way for me to get it is if he gives it to me as a gift. That's right. So I think a helpful way for me to think about this, since we've been talking for the last two episodes about kingship, mm -hmm. and you have like this, this Caesar king who's really powerful, and let's say you are a peasant in Rome, and you really want a, I don't know, a, sh a sheep pen for yeah. your house. You know, you want a place yes. to keep your sheep, but you're really poor and you can't afford it. Well, if you were friends with Caesar <laughs> somehow, yeah. as a free gift, he has the power to grant you a sheep pen. Okay. Because he has that power. Yes. You yes. know he has the power because, look, he's got like a billion sheep, right? He's got the power to do it. In the same way, Jesus proved he had the power to defeat death in his resurrection, and he is this king Mm -hmm. And so he can give you power over death yes. as a gift. Yes. Over, yes, death and the thing that causes death, right, which sin. is sin. And he can, he can grant that to you as a gift because he's proven himself as powerful to do so. That's right. Okay. Uh, and I think that's one way to look at it. Yeah, okay. And like he's been proven to be the king over such things. And as the new king, de facto king, more powerful than death and sin, he can grant the power over death and sin yep. to whoever he likes. I can't do it myself. So Jesus says, I've done it for you. I'm your good king. Here's right. the gift of freedom over sin and death. But the complexity of the Christian story isn't that simply that death and sin exist as a power contrary to God, mm -hmm. but that God is also responsible for the consequences of sin and death. Remember, God in his justice gives over the Gentile world. That's right. So we have a problem with the sin and death problem, but we also have a God's justice problem. Yeah. What about this just God who is angry at human evil? Yes. Isn't it God who always sent the Jews into exile? That's right. In their national death? Right. Yes. So to solve this problem, Paul says this in verse 25, Jesus Christ, through his redemption, whom God put forward as a propitiation by his blood to be received by faith. Mm. And so this is another aspect of what Jesus is doing on the cross. He's not just a new king supplanting the powers of sin and death and can now give sin and give life to those who he chooses mm -hmm. as a gift. Right. He can he has also solved the problem of God's justice against human evil. Mm. He's been become a propitiation. And that word propitiation is means that God's justice has been satisfied. Through the shedding of Jesus' blood, the consequence of death that all humanity deserved, the, the demand for God's justice has been satisfied. So there's no more debt of justice left to be paid because Jesus paid it by his blood. Mm -hmm. Am I making sense? I mean, yeah, that's that's the story that's the story I'm more familiar with. That's right. Yes. As a Western Christian. Yeah. yeah. That and that's like a big part of what the gospel means. Like mm -hmm. God does not like human evil. And he wants a way, but he also wants a way for humans to not experience death and sin. Right. And so his justice has to be satisfied, mm -hmm. and it's done through the blood of Jesus. Yeah. And then he, and then Paul goes on to unpack what that means. It's like, hey, like if God's been passing over Gentile sin and Jewish sin for so long now, like how is it morally right for him? Yeah. Isn't God unjust? Isn't God unjust to just pardon us when we have where there's thousands of years of evil mm -hmm. to account for and he says well i've sent my son to do that work mm. so that's the that's the argument he makes there okay and the way that we experience the gifting of the power over death and sin and the uh satisfaction of god's justice is through by having faith in jesus's death and resurrection and that's what i wanted to ask about next go go for it is 
Okay, so we are justified freely as a gift of his grace. Uh, he's a propitiation for our sin on the cross by shedding his blood. But there's this from faith to faith thing mm-hmm, mm-hmm, through mm-hmm. faith. And you even said, like, in the last episode, the thesis statement is it's all faith. Like, by faith in this gospel of this king, mm-hmm. um, the salvation comes, the righteousness is done. But what does it mean to have faith? in Jesus, which is such a crucial word for Romans. Mm -hmm. And how does that bring about an effect to my life and to the salvation of the nations, which Paul has in view here? I mean, what is faith is a great question. (laughs) Uh, It's like, it's such a simple question that it's one of those you don't think about. You use the word faith, belief, trust so often. It's like one of those words that's really hard to describe. I, I was talking to somebody who was applying for a pastoral role and he's a great theologian, like loves Jesus, close follower of Jesus. And he's like, I got this question on my application. Just, what is the gospel? And it's like, <laughs> what isn't the gospel? Well, he's just like, yeah, he just yeah, feels yeah, like yeah. such a big question. He's like, what is faith? It's like, okay, I mean, yeah, let's. it's a big question. Yeah, I mean, I think on a very bare level, it means like mental assent to a certain set of facts. Like mm. it's believing certain things are true on the barest level. On the barest level. On the barest level. You have to believe that Jesus was a real person. You have to believe that he died in your place and that he rose from the like you have to believe a set of facts a set of doctrines mm-hmm. like mental assent to a certain number of things however that doesn't get you very far because the demons believe that Jesus died that's right as a propitiation for your sin and defeated the power of, uh, of hell and they're really scared by that fact they believe in it yeah. but it's not a faith that like does not going to do anything for them right so so in a way he's saying you're not saved by your own actions. Like your own actions aren't going to make you right with God. They're not going to bring justice to the world. We've proven that we're wages of sin, is, sin is death. All yeah. have fallen short. We're not, we're not doing that right. Uh, and so you need to believe and have it in your head that Jesus has accomplished this, this goal mm-hmm. of living right with God, giving you his righteousness, bringing justice to the world. And you need to know that that's the true story. Yes. You need to have that mental assent that that's occurring. Yes. but So that's the barest level. Okay. But what it means more functionally and what it does is that we have a commitment to and a reliance upon God. Mm. We have a commitment to God and we rely on him in order to bring give us right access to him. We rely on him to obey his commands in the world. We are committed to his ways even when it costs us something like Faith is a reliance and a commitment to obeying what God has said and believing what he has said. And I think that gets closer to it. Yeah. Like, what are you thinking? No, I, I, think that? That, I think that's right. Uh, it, because we we need, there, there's like you said, there's like three ways to understand this righteousness, mm-hmm. you know. And I need to be able to rely on God because I know that my moral obedience has definitely fallen short. I did not obey the law. I did not obey the pattern of the created order. Mm -hmm. And I need to be able to rely on a righteousness outside of my own. Yes. Uh, And it does take more than just mental assent that it is, oh, yeah, Jesus did it. That does not keep the demons at bay for me. Yeah. That does not keep guilt and shame at bay for me. I need a daily, vibrant, imaginative reliance that, no, I am actually good and accepted mm-hmm. and loved and treasured and made right with God for so- somehow yes. because of what Jesus did. Yes. And that is a, that's far more than a, a, a mental ascent. That yes. is a, a daily reliance. But then there's also this commitment side, which I think is, is, is well-defined Seth where, um, but what is that, what is that daily reliance doing to propagate the mission of God around the world to go mm-hmm. from this believing community family to save the nations, which is what Paul has in mind for Rome, uh, it's, it's well, I have a commitment to God to yes. live out my faith, to actually not only mentally align what I believe he said in his law and in his word and in his universe, that, oh, yeah, that's how God structured the world. This is what right and wrong are. This is how you bring about life and flourishing. Mm-hmm. I understand those things. But why, when I have faith in them, I live them out, yep. and then I actually bless the world around me mm-hmm. and I actually partner with God 
in bringing his kingdom and life and propagation yeah. to the world because I have this act of faith that's doing it with him. Yes. Paul is about to give us two examples of what a commitment and a reliance is. Right. In in Abraham yes. and in a much more condensed format, David. Okay. Let's, but, yeah, that's, that's, let's do that. But we, yeah. he does that not by telling us that they're examples, mm. but by introducing a new problem first. Oh, great. So because we've said, okay, we're kind of on the same page now. How do we defeat the power, escape the power of death and sin? How do we solve the problem of God's justice against our Jewish and Gentile evil mm -hmm. by faith? Yep. But every Jew is now asking a question. Hmm. Well, what about all the laws that God told us to do? Right. D didn't they have something to do with how we related to God? Isn't aren't those important? Right. To what? the basis of our relationship with God is. Yeah, didn't didn't our law say if you obey these commands, then you'll stay in the land and be my people? And so or, and the, if, the, if not, I'll kick you out? The accusation is, so Paul, are you just throwing out God's law? Right. It can't and, all be faith. What about obedience? Right. Yeah. And so, and Paul says, no, we're not throwing out the law at all. And I think he's using the word law here a little bit, maybe more messily than we might want to think, but he says, we're not throwing out the law at all. Remember Abraham. Mm -hmm. And then he gives us Abraham. And so this is not only an example of the type of faith that we should have, but it's also an answer to this other question. Like, well, what do we do with all the laws that God told us mm -hmm. to obey as Jews? And he, so he's actually going to say that, no, let me show you. The law actually proves that you're saved by faith. That's right. Okay. Let's look and at that. So, and so what he does in uh, chapter four, Paul brings up the example of Abraham in in. God's conversation with Abraham where he chooses him out from the Gentile world mm -hmm. and says, you are now my chosen people. Genesis tells us that Abraham believed, mm -hmm. had faith, had faith, and it was counted to him as righteousness. Mm. So Paul points out, hey, when the whole God's relationship with the Hebrew people began, the Jewish people began, it began on the basis of faith, mm -hmm. Right. That Abraham believed God. that what God said was true. And it was counted to him as righteous. God gave him a status with him that he did not have mm. prior. He rescued him from the power of Babylon. That's right. Justice. Justice. Yep. Like he is doing something here. And how did he do it? By faith. Mm. So let's mark that. And then, and then he gives another example of David. And he says, isn't this also what David taught us when he quotes this psalm? He says, blessed are those who whose lawless deeds are forgiven and whose sins are covered. Blessed is the man against whom the Lord will not count his sin. Hmm. And so that might be a little confusing, but, but the idea here is the underlying principle of asking God for forgiveness is that God, you're asking God to treat you other than what you have done. That's right. Because in order to be forgiven, you did not obey. You did not obey, but right. by your trust and reliance upon God's absolving power, you are asking for forgiveness. Not based on what you've done, right? but by faith in him. Yes, by faith that he will forgive. Right. And, and the psalmist says that person who trusts that despite their disobedience, God will forgive them, that person is blessed. Yes, so you say, hey, two founding me mm. figures of Abraham our and David. Abraham and David both understand that their relationship and inclusion in God's like mm. covenant family is based on faith. Yeah. Abraham had faith. David believed contrary to his actions, he could have a right standing with God. What is that? That's called faith. And then the Jewish person might say, well, they're both Jews, though, mm. like by virtue of being Jewish. Yeah. And then Paul says, well, hey, not actually. Abraham <laughs> was given that promise before he was circumcised. That's right. He was still a Babylonian. He was still flesh. a Gentile when all that went down. Yeah. Um, so what does that tell us? That tells us that anyone who has faith like Abraham is part of the Abrahamic family. Regardless of their flesh. Regardless of their circumcised status. That's yeah. Right. And so it's like, it's a pretty mind blowing argument. Oh yeah. Um, uses their own law against them. Right. And he's like say it well not even against me. He's like, mm. you don't fully understand. Right. You're saying we're breaking the law. This is the fulfillment of the this law. This is what the law intended to us to believe. Mm -hmm. That the way that we first gain access to God's family is through faith. Yeah. Abraham believed it before he was circumcised. And the whole idea of forgiveness is predicated on the idea that we can access God apart from what we do. That's so good. Um, and so that is his like mic drop moment where he says, doesn't the law 
Am I not upholding the law, dear Jew, Mm. by saying the way that we enter God's family and remain faithful to him is by our belief and commitment to him? So good. And then he deepens it further. And by the way, didn't Abraham basically believe in resurrection from the dead? Wasn't the quality of his faith that his body was dead, Sarah's body was barren, and that he would give birth, that she would give birth to a son? Hmm. Isn't the idea of a son from the dead the basic belief in Christianity, (laughs) the belief in the Messiah? Isn't the, am I not upholding the law when I say, when we have faith in the resurrected son? that we are made members of God's family. That's too good. <laughs> and he's like, that's what I'm saying. <laughs> Drop the mic. <laughs> Drop the mic. That's so good. Uh, so I think for us then today, because that makes so much sense, Seth. Thank you for that. Um, for us today, it's just such good news to say the the basic principle of the Bible all the way back in Genesis 12, right? The founding story yes. like, is you are saved made righteous will bring justice to the world apart from who you are and what you do. Yeah. God chooses you, plucks you out, forgives you Mm -hmm. and how you are made right with him and how you bring his rightness to the world is simply by saying, yes, I believe that that's true. Yes. And I'm going to live every day of my life as if I have been called out. I have been forgiven. I have been made right. Mm -hmm. And, and it is that reliance and commitment Mm -hmm. to that fact that, marks the christian life that's right and very particularly for paul's context he is not diminishing any of the jewish concerns about their law he's saying hey you are as jews are a part of god's story Mm -hmm. and by believing in jesus we're bringing to it to its ultimate fulfillment it is good being jewish there is value in what god has done through your people and it's to point us to the fact that in the jew jesus is christ Mm -hmm. death and resurrection all people can be included in the family of Abraham. Yeah. The world can be blessed finally. Yeah, because another way, of Jesus. yeah. Another way to say that is, oh, you want to be really, really Jewish? Yeah. <laughs> be like Abraham and and have faith in a resurrected son. Yeah. And then you'll be super Jewish. <laughs> you'll be really Jewish. <laughs> it's like it'll be the <laughs> ultimate fulfillment of your law story. Okay. Well, that brings us kind of to a hinge point in the book, right? It does. Yeah. Okay. Paul kind of goes from like Proving the basics. Hey, we're all equal in sinfulness. Yep. We have all been justified and made righteous. The same way. The same way. Yep. So the next chapters, five through chapter eight, kind of discuss the benefits that are given to all people Mm. because they are now in the united family of Abraham. Oh, okay. So a way to say that would be... um, We've, we've talked about how we're all in the united family of Abraham, mm-hmm. but that family was supposed to bring a blessing. What's the blessing? Yes, that's right. Hey, we were all in the, under the family of sin. Now we're all under the family of Abraham by Jesus. What does Jesus do in this new community, in this new humanity that God is forming? Yeah. And what are we doing in the world? Well, sweet. We'll look at that in the next episode. So thank you all for joining us for this episode of the Spoken Gospel Podcast. We will see you next time. Thank you for listening to the Spoken Gospel Podcast. Spoken Gospel creates short films, devotionals, and podcasts like this one. Everything we make is free because of generous supporters like you. To see our resources, visit SpokenGospel.com or subscribe to our YouTube channel. Thanks for listening. See you next time.